So today's agenda, well, obviously we're going to have a presentation by our featured uh, speaker, and then we'll field question and answers. Um, the presenter has asked that there may be a few times where he might ask for input prior to the question and answer session. Um, so again, you can use the um, procedures I mentioned before. After the uh, presentation, you will receive an, an email from us asking for your feedback. This is the website, but you know, um, the information will be contained in an email. And we really invite you to share your feedbacks, not only to guide our future planning of events such as this, but also to guide the overall project, which is designed to identify needs for research uh, on collegiate recovery. So now um, our presenter. Um, today's presenter is Matt Vogel. He's a speaker, a learning designer, and a facilitator, and he's a producer of the Cannabis Classroom. We are excited to have him here today, so I will turn the screen over to him, and he's going to bring up his presentation. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure you can hear me. Uh, Tanya, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Sounds good, and I will tell you when I see your screen. All right. Great. Hey, first thing I'm going to bring up, folks, is a PDF document that yeah, I, looks want, good. I want to remember to, to send this out to people if you want it. And I'll have all kinds of ways throughout the presentation that you can contact me. This is a document I created about a year ago. People were asking, they said, well, what do I do with, with someone who maybe, I, I want to have some guidance around facilitating a conversation if someone's making a decision, especially college students around substance use, whether it be cannabis related or something else. Um, these are just in no particular order, a series of questions that I think are like, really kind of a nice um, prompting for critical thinking. So much of what we want to do is around critical thinking and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, future thinking of people's future, et cetera. But these are different questions that I, I found to be great conversation starters with students. You don't have to use this as a script or anything, but looking at like motivation, what are personal factors? Is there pressure to use? If so, is that internal, external pressure, family history? Um, what about like this in the middle here? It says mindset and setting. What's your mental state expectations? Who will you be with? What's the environment like? All of these things we sort of, we, if we are for wanting people to practice and try on critical thinking, um, how do we do this in a way instead of a split second decision that so many people are doing when it comes to using substances, right? They walk in very subtly, someone hands them a shot, someone hands them a vape pen, whatever it may be. Um, so this is a way to sort of have that conversation in a little bit more of a nuanced way. I just wanted to show it right off the bat and, um, and offer that to people if they want it. You can email me, I'll send you the PDF, no problem. So wanted to put that out right away before I get into um, my slides. So I'm gonna move the toolbar just a little bit. And okay, here we go. So I'm really excited to be with you all. I love talking about substance use. I love talking about cannabis. It's a fun uh, topic for me to talk about. I, I, I worked full, full time in higher ed for about 16 years in student affairs and teaching. So I had a student affairs job, did generalist health education work at a few different, a couple different universities, and then taught also generally in the psychology department. I would teach the uh, drugs and behavior classes, um, sometimes a co-occurring disorders class I would teach in, for the master's in mental health counseling class, and I've taught drugs and society classes. So I, I live in Southern Oregon, and I still have affiliations with Southern Oregon University, although I don't, I, I have so much contract work that I'm doing and independent work that I'm doing that I, I departed that my full-time role there, but I still teach as an adjunct. So I teach uh, drugs and society classes there uh, on an ongoing basis. So there's some of my contact information. I do have a website. I don't update, in full transparency, I don't update it as much as I should, but there's that. And then there's my email address if you wanted to reach out to me. Uh, that's a great way to connect with me. And I'll have that up at the end as well. So I wanna get us started here. First thing is, use that Q&A box. And if you just have a sentence, maybe, why did you decide to participate in the session today? You're all busy people. You have a lot going on and life is busy. And I, but I'm really curious to hear a little bit of feedback from people of why they decided to participate in the session today. So feel free to, to use that Q&A box to type something in. Um, and it's also a good chance for you to practice that and uh, make sure that the, the functioning of it is working. So I will ask Tanya. Tanya, do you have anything that anyone's written in? Yes. Maybe um, you could tell us a few of them. We don't need to obviously read them all, but it'd be great to hear a couple of them. Sure. One participant said, I'm glad cannabis is becoming more widely discussed. 
Great. The person said, I love learning more about substances that my peers are using. The more educated I am, the better I can serve my community. Great. Um, and I, wait, there's one more comment. Um, another person said, because cannabis is such a commonly used substance here, and some students have really bad experiences with it, while others have healthier use. So that's why they joined. Got it. There's Good. more. Hold on. Uh, we wanted to know about the real issues with cannabis. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more of an issue of cannabis use on our campus, looking for innovative new ways we can address this. Got We're it. working on updating our campus cannabis harm reduction approaches. Great. Uh, it often feels as though the culture on this campus revolves heavily around cannabis use. So opening the conversation is beneficial in my opinion. Perfect. And, and last, wanted to understand the aspects of cannabis. Great. Okay, those are fantastic. And I, what I, if you, what was interesting is you're all using the word cannabis, and that's something that I do through, I do as well. And I, I think you know we'll sort of give a brief history. You know, uh, in some of this, what we're going to talk about, some of you have really high knowledge levels around this. I want to just make sure I'm meeting folks where they're at, but there's going to be a real different perspective and different uh, experience levels with this topic. So we'll try to approach it from those different places. And with students particularly, I think there's so many different angles to approach education with them on this topic. I'm a big advocate, obviously, of substance use education. I think it, it, it's beneficial. It's also important to, it encourages people to think about who they are, how they're developing, their identity development, all these things that sort of factor into it. I've had students who would tell me, they would sit down in private with me and in a really vulnerable, honest way, say, I don't really even even like cannabis anymore. I don't like, as I used to like it. It was fine. It was fun. It was great. But now I get kind of paranoid or anxious when I, when I use it. And I used to never experience that. And, but my friend group has sort of formed around cannabis and I don't want to be the person who's not using now. So how do I navigate that, that territory, right? So it's not just about, Hey, what is this doing potentially to your lungs, to your, to your, to your brain, to your cannabinoid receptors, if you're using chronically, all this stuff. It's about I, sometimes who we are, our health, identity, all those pieces play, play into it for sure. So we'll try to get into that as much as possible. So our quick agenda, we're going to do a very brief history. We're going to look at some myths about the plant because so much of the cannabis industry is based on a little bit of potentially mythology. Um, we're going to look at what is CBD? Where is that coming from? What's happening? What's, what, what is the research saying about it? And where is all this coming from? How did it get so popular all, all of a sudden in the last year or two? We're going to focus on concentrates and edibles. And I have a video that I produced that I will maybe show if we have time. It's about six minutes long. We're going to talk about ideas for future research. And then there's a few things we'll kind of, I'll try to sort of weave in throughout the whole session around health impacts. We'll weave in some discussion around cannabis and students in recovery. And that's something for you to think about. When you think about students on your campus, do they approach uh, as students in recovery, do they look at cannabis a little bit differently? Does it depend on what kind of state you live in? If it's legal or recreational, if it's legal for medical, if it's fully prohibited, does that influence the perspective? Do they, right? I think it's a really important one to get at. I, I'm trying to, uh, when I talk to students in recovery, they have different perspectives sometimes on what does recovery mean for them on a very personal level? And what does that mean when it comes to a relationship with certain substances related to that? Uh, I've definitely talked to students in recovery. Some of them use Kratom, right? But they would still identify as being in recovery. So it's a, it's a really uh, interesting territory, I think, for us to, to explore and be thinking about throughout as well. So if you've seen me ever present before, I, I love showing this slide. And, and by the way, I'm a generally a really interactive presenter. I love to have a lot of discussion with, with an audience when I'm with them. And um, so, it, you know, being remote and digital, I'll try to stay as engaging and in, in, in with you as possible. But we all know who this is, right? This was Nancy Reagan. This was back in the 80s. Um, she started the Just Say No campaign in 1986. It was a very pivotal year for drugs. There was the mandatory minimum sentences, which is passed, those laws, uh, famous basketball player Len Bias died. There was a lot going on socially uh, around, um, you know, cr crack had sort of become more prominent than powdered cocaine. And this was a very, I think, well-intended um, uh, campaign, right? And I ask students sometimes, I'll put this picture up, and as the years go on, less and less students know who she is. I had one student yell out really excited, oh, that's, I know who that is, that's Judge Judy. I said, no, it's not, it's Nancy Reagan. So, um, 
if you sort of question this narrative of a just say no, it doesn't mean you're just say yes, right? It means that it's a nuanced topic that warrants uh, a, a level of sophistication to approach, I think, with young people. So I love this sort of just say no mentality, knowledge, empowerment, information, education, the empowerment, critical thinking. That's where the lens that I generally uh, approach this from. And, and drugs are kind of interesting to talk about, right? We're, we're all kinds of different substances, right? We have a few different examples on this page here. We have LSD on the top left, kratom in the middle, top, top middle, psilocybin mushrooms up there in the corner, some cannabis flowers, uh, a powdery substance with a needle. It could be any number of things. And then we have on the bottom right, uh, ayahuasca, uh, the, the compound plants that are used to make ayahuasca, which is becoming a more popular psychedelic. So it's an interesting topic, you know, to, to think about and look at. And what I've noticed re regarding substance use and what I've noticed in particular with cannabis is there is a ton of confirmation bias, right? So here you go. Surprise. Here's 11 facts that support all of your opinions. We are in a state of heavy confirmation bias, whether it be political, whether it be all kinds of social topics and, and maybe controversial topics, but in particular with cannabis, you will find an incredible amount of confirmation bias, right? So if people are very opposed, sort of seek out information that will confirm their pre-existing ideas. And people who are very pro, and you've probably noticed this, especially your students who are really pro, will only seek out information that really validates that. So one way I talk about confirmation bias every time I talk about cannabis with young people. And, and my challenge to them is try your best to suspend it by 5% or 10% and really approach this from an open perspective and see what happens, right? Especially for those students who are just absolutely unwilling to acknowledge there could be some challenges that come up with it. It's a good, real nice place to start. So as we talked about in the, uh, in the agenda, we're gonna do just a very brief history and I'm not gonna take long with this, but I think it provides a landscape for this because this history around cannabis is a rationale and justification that I've found a lot of students will say, well, the laws are rooted in, negative things and and i don't like that so they'll sort of as a rebellion to that use cannabis right it's it's part of it and they study it if you haven't noticed that your students who love cannabis love to study it and they love to research it this is part of it the lore and the the aspects of the history of it so if you look at this this is an image here we have heroin right heroin was made by bayer pharmaceutical company it was heavily readily available in the early late 1800s early 1900s and legal, no problem, right? And then cannabis as well. Cannabis was pretty standardly used a lot in the early 1900s. It was not uncommon to, it was part of the pharmacopoeia. We, it was just around, it was definitely there. And you could see people at the time called it cannabis. Now, and then we have people like this, right? Henry Ford, very conventional person said, why use up the forest, which were centuries in the making and the mines, which required ages to lay down, if we can get the equivalent of forest and mineral products and the annual growth of the hemp fields. So this is again, part of that. People were looking historically that hemp was used, hemp was grown, early, right? In the, for, for hundreds of years, hemp has been grown and used as a product for rope, fiber, uh, fuel, um, making biodiesel, all kinds of things. And originally Henry Ford wanted the, the, some of the original Model Ts to run on hemp-based biofuels. So people will kind of talk about that, like, hey, it has maybe these benefits and they'll sort of apply that logic. Well, if hemp has maybe an environmental benefit or a resource production benefit, then I should be able to smoke dabs 10 times a day, right? So there's a stretch that will maybe get made there as well. So this person, William Randolph Hearst, him, he was in charge of newspapers and forestry. And this person, Andrew Mellon, the Secretary of the Treasury, they sort of essentially colluded to say, hey, we need to get rid of hemp. It's cutting into other industries, particularly the timber industry and some synthetic industries. And so they really leaned on this guy who is actually Andrew Mellon's um, um, son-in-law, uh, Harry Anslinger to to try to outlaw and prohibit cannabis and basically it's time Anslinger started a campaign they took a slang word marijuana and sort of used that as a way to sort of to, to confuse people essentially and they created a, a campaign in 1935 1936 
to, to do this, right? To show people, look at this marijuana, it's the devil's harvest. And if you look at the poster on the right, weird orgies, wild parties, unleashed passions, someone injecting it into an arm, um, all this kind of stuff. It's sort of funny to look back at this now, but at the, you know, you have to realize there's no Facebook. There's no one talk. No one's like, Oh my gosh, at the time, um, clearly someone could have said, wow, marijuana seems really deadly. I'm glad I just used cannabis because they didn't really know that marijuana and cannabis were the same thing. So this essentially led to this, and this is a, you can read this quote. I don't really enjoy reading this quote, so I'm not going to, but Harry Anslinger, this was testimony he created in the U.S. Congress to support the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. So it was drawing on racial stereotypes. It was drawing on these anxieties around white women and muse, satanic music and all these things, right? That were, it, was, it was so a lot of times, again, p young people now, 2019, will look at some of this history. They study it and say, that is so bad. And therefore, again, rationalizing current day use. So let's acknowledge this. I think as professionals looking at that and saying, okay, there's been a, there was a weird history with this. Let's look at it from a sociological, criminology, psychological lens and say, yeah, th this is the history of that ha is pretty bizarre. Because what happened five years later, we got into World War II and once again, a, a little 13 minute documentary was made by the federal government called Hemp for Victory. And they were encouraging farmers to grow hemp again so we could have the rope and fiber to, to help us in World War II. So it's a pretty fascinating little history there that again, uh, a lot of people love to study. And this leads us to the modern day, right? So in 1970, the Comprehensive Drug Act was passed. And in 1973, the DEA was formed. And from that, we had the scheduling of drugs. We have schedules currently to this day, schedules one through five. A lot of you already know this, but it's worth a quick little revisit here. Schedule one drugs, high potential for abuse, no accepted medical use. Schedule two drugs, you can see on the bottom half there, also high, are categorized as having a high potential for abuse, but has some accepted medical use, and there can be restrictions made on anything in schedule two. So as you know, say with amphetamine, so if, if someone had an Adderall prescription, they cannot go get a two-year supply of Adderall and have that prescription filled, right? You can put restrictions on anything. You, cocaine is technically scheduled too, but you cannot get a prescription of cocaine filled at Walgreens. It's used specifically as an anesthesia for surgery sometimes. There's many other options that are used. But if you look at schedule one drugs, right? Psilocybin mushrooms, MDMA, or what we call molly or ecstasy, cannabis, heroin, LSD, dimethyltryptamine, there's all kinds of compounds in schedule one. Schedule one drugs, essentially the federal government supersedes state law, right? Federal law supersedes state law. So in any state where there's medical laws, where there's recreational laws, people are technically in violation of federal law. Now, Schedule One drugs can be researched. There's a special uh, approval that happens through the DEA and the FDA, and any of these compounds can be researched. And we're seeing a little resurgence of research with cannabis for sure. And starting in a, the, um, about 15 years ago, there's been a pretty big resurgence of research of psychedelics. So some of you might have heard some of this. There's been studies done at Johns Hopkins Medical School, Harvard, a UCLA Medical School, the um, University of Wisconsin. There's an independent study done on MDMA, looking at MDMA and post-traumatic stress disorder. And the outcomes were actually really positive. But here's the challenge with this. I did a talk at the NASPA Strategies Conference in 2012 about the resurgence of psychedelics. I'm just gonna take one minute with this, don't worry. My, my take on it is that it's important to have a sense and understanding of that because students now read these headlines. The stuff around psychedelic research is in very pop culture magazines, news outlets. So uh, people are reading that, right? And saying, well, I had a little bit of trauma. Maybe I'll take MDMA at a party this weekend. And they don't necessarily know what the research protocol is, that it's very, very strict, that in that original MDMA study, it was a five-year study, and people took MDMA on average about three times total in a five-year period. 
So having a sense and understanding of that, and especially now that Michael Pollan wrote a book this last year about psychedelics, and Michael Pollan is a very famous author who mostly writes about food and food systems and sustainable agriculture, but he wrote a book around psychedelics, and it really got a lot more people having an awareness around this. So just a heads up for you, if you have students come to you and say, hey, I, I'm, what do you know about psilocybin research or LSD or um, some of the research in Canada and ayahuasca, what's up with that? They'll, having a general sense of that, but talking how research protocols are very different than taking something randomly on the weekend that you have no idea of the dose, you have no idea of the purity, the environment, all of those things factoring in. So kind of a fascinating a little window of, of what's happening. So with cannabis in particular, there is a lot of debate of whether this should be schedule one or schedule two. Currently it's schedule one, it is talked about all the time, um, but there's been no movement at this time. I occasionally put up- Before, oh, Matt, can I interrupt for it. one second? We have yes. a, somebody who has a question. Let's go for it, perfect. I love that, interrupt any time, I appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, so wh whoever, uh, so the person who's raising their hand, what we'd like to ask you to do is um, type it into the qu uh, question and answer uh, feature, either at the bottom or the top of your screen, if you take your cursor over that. Um, so we have everybody muted, and because we have a large group, we're not doing verbal um, exchanges. So if you could put your comment into a question uh, or a co whatever, your comment or question into the Q&A button, uh, I will read it aloud for you. So sorry, I, I thought they... <clears throat> had put that in, but they just raised their hand. So yeah. Okay, no problem. When, yeah. when that person does that, I will read the feedback. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, occasionally, I will just tell you, I'll put up a pretty picture when we're transitioning topics a little bit. This, these are from the Redwoods in Northern California. Okay, so here's a question I do have for you. If you want to, if I love a little two sentence response to this. I was asked this last week by a student. Can you overdose on pot? Sometimes I just love, I will, I will take mental note and write down what students will ask me. So someone asked me, can you overdose on pot? How do you respond to that? I'm curious, participants, there's a lot of smart people on this call and I'm sure you've been asked this before. What's generally your response? Feel free to uh, write in again. I don't need you to write a, a 10 paragraph essay. Sorry for that. But what if they, what, what do they, what, how does your response generally to this question? Uh, one attend. You can hear me, Matt. Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, one attendee says no. You cannot. Okay. okay. That's it so far. Okay. I'm curious of anybody else. Got uh, a yes. <laughs> another person said yes. You can. Okay. I see. And we another person. <laughs> said um, there hasn't been, there haven't been any reported overdoses. Okay. We have another, I, I saw that one and I, cause I okay. just opened the chat in the Q and A and I see a no there. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So let's, I'm going to kind of pull on this thread here from one of the participants just said, you can probably have a really bad time with too much, but as far as a deadly overdose, I'm not so sure. Okay. So this is a great, this is a great, let's stop there with it if we could. And I, um, so I'll, I'll kind of ask back the question, describe to me what an overdose is. Cause if we're framing it strictly from overdose causes death, um, we don't necessarily see that there are, there have been some cases, right? Where the activities someone engages in. So if someone has, uh, again, a, large amount of an edible concentrate or even flour and maybe uh, have an accident of some kind, then that's, right, th that's an affiliated uh, issue, right? But looking at from a pure pharmacological, does it cause respiratory depression like some other substances would, heroin, alcohol, benzos, et cetera, we don't see that, right? But then if we reframe overdose and think of it in terms of can there be a psychological reaction that is overwhelming, right? That could be uncomfortable, that can be an exacerbating event, that can lead to more maybe intense anxiety. And we, we certainly could see that, right? So it's asking, st students will sometimes ask these questions, you know, just to kind of like bait you a little bit or kind of see where you're at personally, kind of to test the waters. Um, but I think this is a good one that comes up. So it's, re I think for me, I've, I've had good luck in sort of reframing that and talking about do we def how do we define, if we're only defining overdose based on um, fatality, let's, let's look at it maybe from other ways that we could have too much and maybe some challenges with it. 
Okay, so we'll, we'll move on from there. I wanna just talk about the plant a little bit if we could. And I think again, a lot of you maybe know this, but I, I'm, I'm not sure, so I wanna make sure we go there. So these, this, is a, these are, this is an image of a, the colas or the flowers of a female cannabis plant. The male plant does not, con, does not contain flowers. Uh, when we zoom in a little bit of, on these, when they're getting mature, you can see these kind of crystally structures as we get closer in on that flower. Um, and there's a more up close picture of this. There's a reason I'm showing this to you, don't worry. Um, and these little bulbous structures, let's zoom in one more time. These little bulbous structures are called trichomes. And you can see on these, there are these little, some of those are kind of clear, some are sort of cloudy. And, but these do matter when it comes to the user experience. Here's what's interesting, when a cannabis plant is maturing, um, and the flowers are maturing, those trichomes will be clear at the beginning. And the THC levels are actually pretty low at that point. As the THC levels mature and some of the other cannabinoids mature, there's over 100 cannabinoids. The ones we hear about a lot are like CBD, THC, CBG, CBN. Um, but as the plant matures, the THC levels start to increase. So when the, when the trichomes are at kind of a cloudy color, and you can see some of them are kind of cloudy, the THC levels are at sort of their peak. And what's not shown in this picture is if the THC levels, if, if, the, if the plant continues to grow and is not being harvested, the trichomes will, will turn an amber color. And at that point, the THC has actually started to degrade and another cannabinoid, CBN, is starting to increase, which is actually a byproduct of the degradation of THC. So here's what's interesting. CBN is known to be a pretty sedating cannabinoid. So any, regardless of the strain of the plant or the name of the plant, or if it's a sativa or indica, you could have two plants grown side by side, same soil, same strain, same water, everything. You harvest one plant when the trichomes are cloudy, you have to go out of town on an emergency and come back a month later and you harvest the next plant. Even though they were grown in the exact same conditions, based on the harvest time, they can have a very different outcome for the user, right? So sometimes that's not really talked about. So when we go into a store, right, and we say, oh, that's the strain that I want. I read online that that strain is good for X, Y, or Z. It may not necessarily be the case because it depends when that plant was harvested. So it makes, this, it makes it even more complicated to say, well, cannabis causes this, this strain does this. We're not sure about that. It might be a little bit of mythology. And then as we get, as we, when the flower is trimmed and cured and harvested and all of that, right, it, it, it looks like this. So if someone's smoking pot, smoking bud, they're smoking this trimmed flower the cannabis plant. And from that, we can use a little bit of the trim or the sugar leaves or the actual bud. We can make other products out of it, right? So you can make oil or butter and make edibles, which we'll get into, and concentrates, which we'll get into as well. So these concentrated products are, are a pretty different um, thing and they look like this. And when I go back here, these flowers here um, in, you know, in the 70s, the THC level was really low on average. You could find some high THC products, but on average it was really low, one to 2%. Currently it tests out on average about 15 to 20%. And these products here can test out anywhere from about 60 to 90 or even above percent now THC. So we've sort of created a new and different um, product. It's, it's an interesting one. And when we isolate cannabinoids, there's a whole other question of what is the outcome of that. So moving on from there, uh, let's talk about cannabinoids for a minute. These are some of the major ones, and you'll see sometimes these charts. See on the left, it gives a condition, and then it shows which cannabinoids are associated with this. Now, a really good friend of mine, he's an author on cannabis. He's a researcher. He works in the labs. He's a consultant. He gets flown around the world. Him and I had a really honest conversation about this. He's kind of neutral on cannabis, honestly. He said, when you see a chart like this, a lot of times it's not based on a clinical trial, but based on maybe a tail suspension test with mice or a swim test with mice. 
uh, a lot of sort of assumptions are made around it and, and that a lot of these have not necessarily shaken out in, in the data. It doesn't mean they couldn't in the future, but to sort of have this, this narrative that this thing, like CBD, you can see the second one in there, it's associated right with all of these things according to this chart. And I was looking, Harvard has a good page on CBD, CBD about what is actually CBD all about, is there benefit? Um, and they do find there can be some maybe benefit around inflammation, a little bit of around pain, maybe as a sleep aid. Um, and unlike THC, it doesn't necessarily wake people up in the middle of the night. So they, they're looking at that in an honest way to see what is the application. But you can see it's kind of painted as it, it does everything. But cannabinoids do matter. The cannabinoid profile of a flower matters. So the percent of the CBD versus the percent of the THC, that is found to be relevant for the outcome on the user, obviously in terms of how intoxicated they get, mental health outcomes, et cetera. Um, this is something else you're gonna hear more about coming up in the future around cannabis is terpenes. Terpenes are like the compounds in many plants that give them a scent. Um, they're like the essential oil sort of of a plant. So if you rub a basil plant or tomato, the vine of a tomato and you smell your hand, it will, it will have terpenes that you're smelling. So there's different terpenes found in different cannabis um, that is associated with certain things. They may have sedating effects or anti-anxiety effects, et cetera. So you're going to hear more about people are talking about full spectrum uh, concentrates. What they mean by that is that it's including the terpenes. It's not just isolated cannabinoids. So the terpene world is talked about a lot in cannabis. Now, this is something where I'm not sure this is real. This has to do with as much as other things. This has to do with uh, strain names. So there's been so much crossbreeding now, and there's been so much uh, attention given to certain strain names financially. Oh, this strain is popular this year. So is it unheard of that a grower would say, oh, yeah, that's, um, that's grape ape. Yep, that's what it is, and sell 100 pounds of it. There's, there's nothing that stops that, right? So uh, again, a, another friend of mine did genetic testing of a cannabis strain called Blue Dream, a really popular strain. And they looked at, they took Blue Dream samples from all sorts of different places and tested the genetics, and they were completely dissimilar to each other across the board. So it, it raised this question, well, which one is the true Blue Dream? Right now, if you're going online, looking up on a website saying, well, this strain does this, the, you, we have to dial that back and say, does it really? Are you sure? When was it harvested? What's the terpene profile? Uh, what, what's the genetics of that? Are, are, you, are we sure? And so there's this push to sort of standardize some of this stuff. But a lot of times in the industry, um, there, there's confusion, but we're, we're sort of sold strain names as, as a all or nothing. And then this other piece of it, sativa and indica, how many of you, uh, well, you don't, you could raise your hand if you want to on this one, but how many of you have heard something like this, that sativas are uplifting, stimulating, energizing, best suited for day use, right? They're a little more heady. You'll hear about indicas being more calm, relaxing, kind of um, couch lock feeling, right? They're more at night, they're more for pain, et cetera. So these, these distinctions we've made between sativa and indica are actually in sort of more, people are studying this plant in a more sophisticated way are saying that is actually, we don't even know if that's real anymore. We were, it's maybe placebo plays more into that than anything. So it's kind of fascinating um, that this is coming up now. But again, we, so we have to think critically. Uh, there we go. I, I love that <laughs> someone chatted in. I've heard indica is in the couch. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's sort of a thing that you'll hear related to, to indicas. So these are the things when it comes to a user experience, cannabinoids, terpenes, and trichomes, when it was harvested, are thought to be sort of valid into the user experience. But the strain names and then the indica sativa distinction is found not to be and a little bit questionable. Again, a couple of friends of mine who study this, we've been talking about this for years. And um, so it was interesting that a, document, a little documentary finally talked about this publicly. But again, a lot of the industry is sort of based on strain names and then the indica sativa distinction. This is a great quote, right? There are biochemically distinct strains of cannabis, but the sativa indica distinction is commonly applied in the lay literature as total nonsense and an exercise in futility. One cannot in any way currently guess the biochemical content of a given cannabis plant based on its height, branching, or leaf morphology. And then in terms of genetics, right? The genetic identity of a marijuana strain cannot be re reliably inferred by its name or by its reported ancestry. So it's sort of a fascinating, um, fascinating place to say. Um, 
to, to look at that. Now there is a, there is something on Netflix. There's a series on Netflix called Explained. And I think they have a current one they just redid maybe a month ago on the brain. It's pretty, I, I've seen maybe two of the five on the brain. Um, but this one on Explained, they were, it was just a series, maybe 20 episodes. They're all about 20, 25 minutes long on random things like the game Cricket. I actually watched that one and still was incredibly confused. Um, there was all kinds of things, but one of them is just called Weed. And in that explained little documentary, it talks about this thing around the plant and sort of maybe this mythology around strain names and indica sativa distinction. So well worth the watch. Um, I, I, mean, I, I don't know. I think it's where I found this to be interesting is when students come in real, especially real confident and their knowledge base around like the history and plants and strains, if you can have this little bit of nuanced conversation with them and say, We're, there's, a, there's some lack of clarity actually around that, um, it, get, it, gets, it leads into a good conversation around the placebo effect. What is placebo? What is our beliefs around things? How does that show up? And look at the data on placebo. Harvard has a great placebo, placebo study center if you wanted to look at that more. Um, to look at different research and studies that have been done. It's fascinating. I, I'm totally fascinated by the mind-body connection, placebo, but letting them wrestle with this a little bit of, hey, what if some of this isn't really true? And what, what, how, do we, how do we really then safely apply, what does that mean? What is, how, how do we think about that then when it comes to a harm reduction message when there's so much confusion around the plants? So let's drill down, hopefully you're still hanging with me and okay, let's drill down into one cannabinoid called CBD or cannabidiol. Why has this gotten so popular? What is the deal with it? What is happening? So CBD, um, and this starts, let's talk about it from this place. These are images of a, what we would call tr a traditional hemp field. You can see hemp when it's grown. Th these hemp plants are grown for fiber and to make products like shirt, you can make clothing, Right. You can harvest the seeds and use them as a food. Um, I actually eat hemp seeds quite a bit. The, the cut hemp seeds, they have a lot of uh, health benefit to them, but you can get them in the grocery store, et cetera. But this is what it looks like. You can see it kind of grows like corn, right? It's, it's these large plants on the upper left. These are old historic pictures of hemp. On the right, you can see a more modern picture of hemp and you can see it being harvested with heavy machinery and it's tall. It's this humongous plant, right? That looks like that and it's grown that way. But now we've had, and it looks unlike this. This is an outdoor where I live in Southern Oregon. There are plenty of plants that grow like this. I live in a climate where cannabis grows incredibly well outdoors. I've been up close and personal with plants like this. A friend of mine grew four, he has a large backyard. He grew four of these plants in his backyard, which is legal to do. Um, and and they, some of them are very big and you see them all over uh, when you're just walking your dog in the neighborhood or taking a drive in the countryside, you see a lot of grows, outdoor grows. So you can see these look very different. They're huge outdoor plants grown as for medical or rec purposes. But there's something new that's kind of in the middle. And this is what it looks like. These are, this is, there's um, about 10,000 acres in production. My counter and so again, these are what are being called hemp plants now. But you can see they look different than this. But why are they still called hemp? Well, anything that falls, any um, cannabis flowers that have under 0.37% THC can be categorized as hemp. And that falls under the farm bill. It's under the jurisdiction of the farm bill. That may be changing. There's some talk of changing that legislation. But as of now, that stands. That was passed in 2014 and in an update in 2018. So these plants right here, you can see as they start to grow, they sort of look like that. They get a little bit bigger, but they're not that massive outdoor looking plant, but they're certainly not looking like corn. And you'll see a lot of signs like this around these, these grows. It says, do not remove the plants. This is industrial hemp. There's no THC. So this sort of movement to try to ask, you know, on these huge multi-acre, 50 acre, 100 acre swaths where you can't really have fencing up everywhere, People are putting this up to let people know this is, does not have THC. Please don't steal these plants when the flowers are, are mature. So the flowers are, are used on these plants. You can see here's a, a field. This is, these are a little bit more mature. You can see they have a flower on, flowers on them now. These are grown specifically for CBD. 
So these plants are, con they're, they're considered hemp, but they are grown and processed for the CBD. So when you see CBD in infused oils, lotions, um, in food, as a supplement, tinctures, et cetera, it's, it's mostly coming from these types of plants that are grown specifically for that with very, very low levels of um, THC. So this is the, the last one I would show you. This is one, this is about three miles from my house. I was driving one of my daughters, she's on the rowing team. So I was driving her out to the lake with, and, and we, so we go by this field, we were going by this field, you know, every day in the fall. Now it's been harvested, but I um, got on, I, I pulled over, got on top of the hood of the car so I could get a better angle and took a picture of it. So you can see, this is sort of what it looks like. And when we go back to this picture, you can see these, this plastic is laid down. So this is a very controversial part of it. They lay down this, this plastic for weed suppression and to retain water. Um, and it heats up the soil as well, but it's generally one-time use plastic. So there's an environmental cost to growing this because that plastic gets torn up and it ends up in a landfill. And you, you apply that to thousands of acres, there's an environmental impact that that has. And um, so people are trying to figure out and resolve that. How do we do this? Can we do it without all the mulching, right? It, let's let's really talk about that when we're thinking about environmental sustainability and water usage and all of it. They're, 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 that's a part of it. So this is where that comes from. This whole thing of people saying, "Well, why in is in my state cannabis is illegal, but I go to the grocery store and there's a there's a CBD product. How does that work?" Almost every state allows CBD on some level. Um, there, there's a few exceptions, but the, at least 46 states fully allow it. There can be restrictions. There can be different testing that goes on um, that to make sure that those levels, the THC levels are low. So that's the summary of that. I found, I found there's been a lot of confusion around that. What is it? Where's it coming from? Et cetera. So that's what we're seeing a lot of it. Okay. I'm talking so much. I feel like I, I want to have a conversation with you, but I know this is the nature of a webinar. Uh, here's your next question. So Matt, before we go on to your next question, yes. can I share two questions that came, came in? 100%. Go for it. Yeah, okay. So... Um, all right, so one person had two questions. Uh, isn't it safe to say that the history of cannabis is very racist and violent for people of color? And then they acknowledge to take this back a few slides. Mm -hmm. And the person also asked, um, how exactly should we answer the question of can you overdose on pot? <laughs> and you had stated that you would rephrase the question by asking what does overdose mean? But could you explain how you would fully answer the question? Yeah, that's, that's I'll essentially- I'll let you answer that and then there's one more question. Great. That's essentially what I do. I, re, I reframe it and ask them how to define overdoses. If we're just looking at fatality by death in terms of looking at fatality in terms of uh, respiratory depression, we don't see that. There has been cases, some recent cases where some people who are immune suppressed and, if, and especially if they have contaminated concentrated products, there can be issues that go on in their lungs and they, they die from that. We've seen some of that, but from a pure kind of pharmacological perspective, cannabis flowers, often we generally do not see that. There can be anomalies or allergic reactions people can say, but then I do reframe it and say, but let's think about overdose in terms of a psychological perspective. And when we think about exacerbating events psychologically, that can be a, a triggering event for future anxiety, um, what have you, that an intense cannabis experience can serve as that for people. Uh, an intense car accident can serve as that. Uh, an intense alcohol experience can serve as an exacerbating event. But a really strong cannabis experience for many people will report, hey, I had way too much of an edible. It was really challenging for me. And, and it led to me having a, some more anxiety that was coming up for me. So, um, right. And, and, and someone commented, but then any traumatic event could be considered an overdose. I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm talking about it in terms of a, an exacerbating event, not necessarily related to overdose. So can you have too much and can it be um, then in that, in that way, right? We're, we're, we're sort of talking about it like psychologically, can you overdose, right? And, and related to cannabis. But yes, a similar type of situation could arise from something else. Now back to the question on race. Um, yes, for sure. I think it's very safe to say that, that there are a lot of drug policy, even policy around opium and cocaine, uh, cannabis. When you look at the history of it, there's a lot of roots in, in racism around that. So it's an important thing to address. So if we're taking kind of a holistic approach and looking at cannabis, looking at drugs in general, looking at history of that, looking at it from a social justice lens, from a 
from a sociological lens, from a pharmacological, psych, physiological, and health and wellness perspective, yes, I think it's an important thing to acknowledge in a well-rounded discussion. So um, one question, um, a person asked, so are CBD plants different or just harvested at a different time? Yes, they are actually different. The, the, a lot of them are, are bred uh, in a way that they have very low levels of, they have almost no th trace amounts of THC in them. So that there's been, this has been, it, it, they kind of, there was a hybrid, it was essentially a hybrid that came from traditional hemp plants and, and um, but grew them in a way, in a hybridized way to keep on downgrading the THC levels to the point where it almost doesn't exist in the plants. So they are actually different plants. Here's the challenge though. It's kind of a little bit of a wild west industry right now. So you've had people who have gotten seeds and they plant them and then they, they grow, they put in all the work and effort and everything and then they harvest them and the THC levels are like at 8% or something like that. So they were not necessarily bred correctly on that level. So it, they are bred in a different way for sure. And what I, the other thing I wanna to add to the hemp conversation, there's been four um, farmers, at least documented in Oregon who have committed suicide, um, hemp farmers because there, we, we didn't have a great year necessarily weather-wise, and they're, they're looking at crop failure. There was more moisture in the fall, which leads to a lot of mold in the flowers. And, and I think there is a, um, it gets interesting when there's a lot of money involved and a lot of money invested. With the, the, this is a very unfortunate part of that, that people felt such pressure around this. And I, and I've heard, heard, I don't have them confirmed, but I've heard of more even in, in other states as well. So it's, it's a fast, there's all these little things that are, are approaching it. You know, it's easy. We just see CBD on the shelf and go, oh, okay, there's CBD. But again, um, looking at what is the medical application of that? What are contraindications? Let's do more and more research. That's important. Okay. So are we, we're good to move on. I think this is a, a question that I sometimes, we don't have to chime in on this one if you don't want to, but a lot of times students will want to talk about this. If you had to, how would you define adult responsible use of cannabis? We sort of have a framework around this for alcohol. We talk about blood alcohol concentration. We talk about BAC, uh, you know, the biphasic effects of alcohol and 0.06 and drinking water and staying hydrated and all these different things that we talk about related to it. If someone is around or choosing to consume alcohol, we don't as much have a great roadmap regarding cannabis. So it's something that I have this in, as one of my, at the end, one of my research questions is what, what does a harm reduction message look like around cannabis for students? Who, if you know, if they're telling you I'm going to use, well, how do we do that? Right. We can talk about that, the, the, the document that I had on different decisions that people can make and thinking about it from a critical lens. But when we think of the, the wide range of all of these different products that are going on right now, how do we then have this conversation? It really changes and everyone biochemically responds to it differently. We have different endogenous um, cannabinoid receptors in our, in our system. So we all respond to it really differently. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a question I think we're gonna continue to wrestle with uh, in, a, in a field in higher ed particularly and thinking about all kinds of students, students in recovery, students who are curious, students who are currently using. How do we, how do we talk about this? It's something I think is a, we should, it's an important discuss, discussion to think about. So we'll move on from here. As we talked about, these are large cannabis plants. These are what they look like indoor. So in indoor facilities, they keep them pretty small, trimmed up, and then they just really focus on the major flower production. So what I want to do, uh, we'll talk about concentrates. We have concentrated products. As, as a lot of you have heard about this, there's concentrates. Some are called wax or shatter or butter. There's all kinds of different slang terms. If someone's smoking concentrates, it's called smoking dabs. Um, you've heard lately that there's been some challenges related to uh, uh, vaping concentrated cannabis products again with a real and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly what maybe is leading into that and causing some of that what are the factors playing into it but the main thing to think about with concentrates is that they are kind of a different product they they the thc levels are at a point where they're much higher than they've they, they can possibly be in the plant. And we have, a, we have history of that. We have a history when we isolate compounds from a plant, the issues generally go up and there's more problems with those. So um, I'm gonna show you a video. This, there, I've been, and some of you, if you know this, 
be patient with me. I've had a great and incredibly busy 2019. So I've, I've started a little side project called the, the Cannabis Classroom. And this is going to be a product that is essentially I would, uh, you know, this would be a product that's colleges could use. It's sort of in the, in the realm of an online education program that students could take before they get to campus or for conduct issues. It takes about an hour to complete. It is, the demo is so close to being done. So if you're interested, I can send you the demo. Um, and in every section, we talk about the uh, history, uh, kind of a looking at the plant, concentrates and edibles. We talk about identity development, health and wellness, all kinds of things that we talk about. In every section, I have a short video. Most of them are about two to three minutes. The one I want to show you is on concentrates and edibles. This is one of the longer ones. It's about a six minute video. So I, I think we have time to show it if that's okay. And in the video, you're going to hear me talk about the entourage effect. The entourage effect is something where how all the cannabinoids um, blend together when a human being takes them and some have synergistic effects with each other. Some have antagonistic effects with each other. There's different impacts that um, the, the, all the cannabinoids have on one another. So it, when the cannabinoids get off kilter, when the when the it's if it's pure THC or really high levels of THC, that entourage effect gets altered, and people are more likely to have potentially an anxiety response to that. So you, if you hear me say the, um, if you were to hear me talk about talk about that, that's what's what that's about. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go out of this for a minute. I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. And I'm gonna share a different screen so we can watch this video. And I, I wanna apologize on, we have all of our videos uploaded on Vimeo. They all have um, closed captioning, but I didn't wanna have a bunch of windows open for this webinar and, and risk that. So I downloaded it. And in the download, I was not able to download the closed captioning. So I just, I, I apologize for that. But on, in the final product, all of the videos are closed captioned, but just bear with it. Um, I, this one doesn't have it. So again, my apologies. Okay, I'm gonna start it. Tanya, if this doesn't sound doesn't come through or something doesn't work right, let me know and I can interrupt, okay? Okay, sounds good. Thanks. This next section is an important one. This is about edibles and concentrates. Now, any presentation I give on cannabis, I try to create a lot of space to discuss this topic because it's really confusing for people. Now, people have been taking cannabis in many different forms for a very long time, but we have new products that we need to consider, and there's a pretty big knowledge gap right now happening. And working in the university system for so long and teaching classes and having a lot of discussions with students, I've heard hundreds of accounts and stories from them about their experiences with cannabis, and a few themes have emerged. In general, if they've had an adverse reaction to it, the vast majority of the time, this has been from overconsuming an edible or a concentrate. And when this happens, the experience can be absolutely overwhelming emotionally, physically, mentally, and it can last a long time. So what is going on here? Why are these experiences so varied? Let's take a look. As we've discussed, cannabis flowers contain a mix of cannabinoids, with THC being the one that's psychoactive. Now, THC levels have changed and altered over time in the U.S., but they are currently testing out, on average, about 15 to 20 percent. This is significantly higher than it was 30 years ago. Now you contrast that with some of the concentrates right now, and some of those are testing out between 60 and 90% THC. And we've discussed the entourage effect, how this whole mix of cannabinoids and terpenes mix together and work together to alter the absorption and assimilation of cannabis in the human body. A concentrated product really alters that entourage effect and creates more variability and maybe challenge for the user. An additional thing to consider is that a lot of concentrates that are not made in a certified lab may contain contaminants. And concentrates are not new. We've seen this throughout history. Let's look at a couple examples. One is the coca plant. The leaves of the coca plant are chewed and they have the stimulation of maybe a double shot latte. But if you extract cocaine hydrochloride from the plant and isolate it, now it is much stronger, 100 times stronger. Another example is opium. Opium contains two alkaloids in it. One is codeine and one is morphine. Morphine is stronger than codeine. It binds with great affinity to the opioid receptors and it is significantly stronger than when found in the plant. Another one is cat. From cat, you have a compound called cathinone. Now in its natural form, cat is often chewed like tobacco. It's used in parts of Northeastern Africa and in the Middle East. 
and it has some cultural significance there as well. But when you isolate cathinone from it, again, it is much stronger, almost similar to cocaine. Now let's go back to cannabis. Now here we are, we're in this era where cannabis, now we have different isolates and concentrates and uh, you hear about people smoking dabs. These things are different. They have a different outcome for people than the natural plant. And, and am I comparing isolated cannabinoids to cocaine? Not necessarily from a pharmacology perspective, but more from a pattern perspective. We have seen historically how isolating compounds from a plant creates a different experience and outcome for the user. We have to keep this in mind as we develop new products and learn more. So what about edibles? What is up with edibles? Well, let's talk about it. So when we smoke cannabis, very little of it passes through the liver. But when we consume it orally through an edible, a lot does. And it's thought that about 50% of the Delta-9 THC, or what we call THC, is converted to a metabolite called 11-hydroxy-THC. Now it's thought that 11-hydroxy-THC is about four times stronger than Delta-9 THC. So when that goes into the brain, it can be pretty intense. And we are also very slow to absorb and metabolize cannabis when we consume it. So therefore, when we eat an edible, it may take anywhere from 60 to 120 minutes to feel the full effects of that. Now, someone may take some, wait 45 minutes, they don't feel anything, what do they do? They take more, and then two hours later, they're in a very, very uncomfortable situation. Now, when this happens, a lot can occur for someone. Generally, a common feature is pretty severe anxiety. Another one is your periphery vision can be really altered and it creates kind of a tunnel vision and therefore operating a motor vehicle can be really, really dangerous. Racing and erratic thoughts can be common as well. And in kind of extreme cases, it can be like a precipitating event that might bring on and facilitate an adverse mental health response. And in general, when you hear people talk about an adverse reaction they had to an edible or even a concentrate, they'll say it was just very uncomfortable and lasted for a really long time. Now, over the years, I've occasionally heard students talk about someone they knew who was maybe tricked or given an edible without their knowledge or consent. I would encourage you, if you hear talk of that kind of situation or if you're around that, please be an upstander and intervene in that situation to stop it. This is drugging someone without their consent. And without having any kind of prior knowledge or existing preparation for that, it can be a really terrifying experience for someone. Now, what if you are gonna be around it or if you know someone who's gonna consume, what are some kind of safety considerations around edibles? Well, one is to understand the dose. And, and if you, someone purchases something from a dispensary, they may know what the dose is, but if some random person gives you an edible, you have no idea what the dose is. So it's recommended if someone's gonna take that, they have a tiny amount and wait about two hours and see what the outcome is. Another important consideration is to say, what's my motivation with this? Why, why do I wanna do this? Another one is, who are you gonna be with? Do you trust the people you're with? What about the setting and the environment you're gonna be in? What about your own mental state going into it? All those things really matter and play into the outcome and the experience for someone. Now again, edibles and concentrates have been taken in different forms historically, and we know that. But currently, the raw material, the cannabis flowers are more potent, and therefore the byproducts of these compounds are gonna be more potent as well. We need to consider this, we need to be thoughtful, we need to be mindful as this evolves over the next 10 to 20 years so that we can be safe and responsible. Okay. All right, um, can you hear me? Oh, yes, can you hear? I can hear you. Okay, great. So I'm going to share. I'll share again my my slides. That is so difficult and embarrassing for me to watch myself like that. Now you know what I look like. There you go. You got it. Uh, but that is a. It's always a little bit painful. But the, you know, we what we really wanted to, to demonstrate in that video is that we we have a history of this, right? When you again concentrating compounds, isolating them, issues generally go up. So I think we're kind of seeing that now. We definitely see more and more, more people having responses to these products that are pretty intense. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Um, just a, one last note on concentrates. This is a dab rig. So these are different, all kinds of things that people would use in terms of smoking dabs. This is called a nail, that piece there where that's getting heated up by a torch. When that nail gets hot, someone takes a bit of their concentrate or a dab of it, touches it to it, vaporizes it, they smoke it. So we've, um, 
you know, there's all kinds of, you don't need a dab rig to smoke concentrates. You can use them in a small vape pen, all kinds of other uh, ways to, to use it. And this is called something called a carb cap dabber. It's a, it kind of deoxygenates and oxygenates the, the, the dab once it touches the nail. And then people can use that sharp end to pick up a piece of their dab to smoke it. Now, one thing I want to mention, you've heard a ton lately about vaping. I know all of you have. You've been, we've been reading about this, what's going on with vaping and what's happening, what's leading to this. Just a couple of days ago, well, this came out last week, actually, but this is just, I pulled this off of WebMD um, two days ago. Exactly. Sorry, not the, a great, the greatest source, but I wanted to, this was a good summary. They found, uh, CDC found that vitamin E acetate is in, has been in all 29 samples of lung fluid from patients who are having vape-related lung injury right now. So something about the vitamin E acetate, again, if you take vitamin, if it's in a lotion, it's fine. If it's in a multivitamin, it's fine. Something about vaporizing vitamin E causes major lung damage that now this is coming to fruition. The other thing to consider, that very good friend of mine who uh, I've mentioned a couple of times, he's working in a lab. And he said, a couple of years ago, he told me, Matt, when people come in and they test their flour, say they want to get their flour sold in a dispensary, that if it tests positive for pesticide and herbicide, and maybe even visually they can see mold on it inside the flowers or mildew, that it is on the onus of that grower to go back to their farm essentially and destroy the rest of that product. Um, and often if they have a large enough amount of it, that's gonna be, there's gonna be, um, it's gonna be made into concentrates. So he told me a couple of years ago, he said, Matt, something's gonna happen with um, underground market, um, concentrates that there's going to be some health issues coming from this because they're concentrating mold, mildew, pesticide, herbicide into these. Um, so it's, it's something to consider. And one last thing I want to read to you, this is from, specifically from Oregon. This is from a, a free cannabis related um, magazine that I picked up. There was an article looking at some of the contamination in in concentrates. And it said the CannaSafe testing company found vitamin E in 13 out of the 15 black market samples. And in another trial found 10 out of 10 tested for, it's called myclobutanil, which is a fungicide that can transform into hydrogen cyanide when it's burned. So again, we have to think about this and say, well, okay, what, and, and again, it raises all these questions of regulation, education, uh, do we do people know where this stuff is coming from? Uh, you know, if if under on the underground market, there's you know contaminated uh, concentrates, and they're just going to random dorm rooms. Do people have any idea what they're doing, what they're taking? So uh, again, the, the education on this, I think, needs to be really strong, and good good conversation about what is maybe potentially leading to it. And then the last thing around this is around uh, edibles. I already mentioned uh, in the video, you saw the thing around edibles and a lot of it gets converted to 11-hydroxy THC, it's a metabolite. In Oregon, at least, this symbol, this red symbol has to be on any edible product that is sold um, legally. And there are, the, the concentrates, a dose of THC in the state of Oregon is considered five milligrams of THC. In other states, it's different. I know Colorado, it's 10 milligrams. So it really varies on the state, but concentrates, again, the biggest education message I give people is on the slow metabolism and slow absorption of this when we take it orally. And then it can take a couple hours to feel the full effects of that. So again, this harm reduction message of some people eat an edible, they don't feel anything in 30 minutes. So they take more and then they have a really, really adverse response to it. Very uncomfortable response. And, it, and many, many, I, I interviewed a lot of students who have had an adverse reaction to cannabis and many said it, uh, it was an edible and it lasted 12, 15 hours. Um, very challenging experience for them. Um, one last thing, there was a couple studies that have come out that looked at mental health and particularly age of onset. So when someone's first starting to use cannabis, and in adolescence, it does seem there's an increased risk of adverse psychiatric symptoms. If there's heavy cannabis use by age 18, especially high potency products, there's seen a six-fold increased risk of schizophrenia. I think it's important to, um, with this though, we have to look at it from a really critical lens, take a big picture approach and, and to be, not be disingenuous and to just say, hey, we're unsure. What came first here, the chicken or the egg? Co-occurring disorders are very complicated, right? So. Could someone have pre pre-existing um, schizophrenia? Could they maybe even currently have schizophrenia and they're using cannabis to self-medicate? Even on NIDA's website right now, they still sort of say we're, we're, we can absolutely look at correlation 
but I'm not sure we can totally say causation until we have further research and uh, deeper understanding on this. So that's just one, one thing I think it's really important, but I will say uh, qualitatively, anecdotally, I'm talking to, I've talked to plenty of mental health workers, therapists who will say, hey, five years ago, 10 years ago, I was kind of relaxed about cannabis use as long as someone was sort of moderate with it and you know, getting their work done and whatever. And, and I would just, you know, but they've, they've said they've had to, in a humble way, sort of reframe their perspective on it and get into a different conversation. What is the product you're using? Quantity, frequency, it concentrates, all that stuff. And they've, they, they, a lot at least have reported to me, they see more challenges that people are having around it. Again, considerations for sure. Okay, so here's a beautiful picture. <laughs> um, and great we've got some questions yeah let's do it during during so you can look at a pretty picture during the questions this is in northern california in the trinity alps highly recommend hiking there <laughs> anyway okay so the first question is what is the impact of cannabis use in males with near puberty onset yeah okay so there's some there was a study i know there's a study done in pakistan on this and they found that again it was sort of based on quantity use but they looked at they found there was Poten uh, potential issues on even growth differences. Um, another study, this was an animal study, found that the, it delayed the onset of puberty um, when people were using cannabis use. So there was something disruptive to that. And as we know, right, the brain is developing wildly during that time, age 13 to 19, there's rapid brain development. But um, we do see that there, uh, the, the other thing you'll read about this when you look at it, almost everything says there are way too many gaps in research on this. And it gets really tricky to do that retro retrospective drug studies, right? It's hard to find someone, especially if they were using cannabis at those at really, really early ages heavily, to, to have people that just use cannabis. They never used any other drugs, other things. So when they're 25 years old, 30 years old, and we can't really run a parallel universe to know what they're what they would be like, right? If if they never use, so it's those are tricky to get at. There's some gap. There's cl clear gaps in the research on that. But if we if we step back from it and think about just the the delicacy, the, the delicate nature of the the endocrine system, the development of humans, the brain, the body. I mean, it's it's a profound time in life. And so if we're if we're doing something that can have an especially chronic use, I. I let me divert a little bit. I talk a lot about adaptation when I talk about drugs. Like the example I give, the simple one: if you're if you're too hot, what involuntarily happens? You sweat. If you're too cold, what involuntarily happens? You shiver. Right? Our body is seeking balance and homeostasis all the time. So when we take a certain drug too much, right? We might have down regulation of dopamine, whatever it may be. But with cannabis, when it's chronically used, they do. There is a finding that the cannabinoid receptors, our endogenous natural cannabinoid receptors, start to retract, and some will kind of temporarily go away. So th th we have to look at that and understand like what would then the issue be with our, if our endogenous cannabinoid system is so much involved with the regulation and modulation of so many different systems in the body, um, right? What then, what happens, right? Some, it might, it, there, there's probably some adaptations that are gonna be occurring, especially then at that pivotal time in development. So. It's a tough one. Uh, the, the short answer is we need more research. The long answer is it's complex, but we do have some, I think, preliminary research to show it can be uh, challenging, delay onset, and maybe have implications for growth. Um, I see another question. Yeah. Yes. What are the best practices implemented on campuses around cannabis? According to the National College Health Association, 40% of people use cannabis. So how can we take this information back to campus? Good question. I, um, I'd have to look at the latest NCHA data. I, you know, as, as far as the past 30 day use, at least the 2018 data, the fall and the spring combined, I think it showed it was about 21, 22% past 30 day use, maybe lifetime use is different or past year is different. I'd have to go back to get that specific data. Um, but yes, so regardless, even if, 2% of students are using cannabis, how do we talk about it? Or they're interested in it, right? Or it's just a little bit more available or it's gonna be legal so perception of harm goes down or it's maybe available for medical so or they have friends who use it. So I think how you talk about it is in honest, earnest ways. And, and for me, I've, I mean, I've been kind of forced because I teach academic classes on substance use in general. So I try to take a really uh, a broad, 
approach to it and f- just force myself to understand all sides of this. Like I said, the psychological, the, 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 the legal, uh, the user experience, sociolo- all of it, psychological, the sociological, I, I think that's important to understand that. It's hard though. It takes a lot of time to really fully tease this out and get credibility with students who are using. And this is such a, a challenge that I hear from a lot of my colleagues. They'll say, it's hard. I go in to teach like a conduct class. We do a conduct class for students who are, they, they've been in trouble for using and they come in with such a confirmation bias. They don't trust me. And sometimes it's, I've had a lot of professionals say to me, it's intimidating. Like they, I have these students rattling off these facts and data points and history. And it's really, it's a little bit overwhelming and, and I'm trying to learn more and understand it. But I, I do think it, for us to really connect with the students on this, we, we've got to have kind of a good solid knowledge base and really understand where they're coming from. So part of that is I try to read really pro cannabis stuff too. I get the free magazines that are completely pro. I go on different websites that are, I think are really pro in, in forums and, and I go on arrowid.org to get drug information to see how they approach it. I think a broad perspective, Perspective and then go on NIDA too. go on the DEA's website, get a huge perspective on it. And I think that helps us connect better. I do think harm reduction, harm reduction messages. I, I mean, we have some good data around that, that that lands a little bit more than just the full finger wag, shame based, fear based uh, approach. Um, but we've, we've got to be able to meet those students where they're at, talk about it in those different ways. Um, so a broad approach that's really informed on our own level, get our own biases in check as well, and uh, approach our students with love, I guess, is in, in compassion. That's the last thing I would say about it. One last question, okay. uh, or so far at least. Um, what would be considered chronic use? Does it vary person to person? This is a great question, and it's actually in my kind of further research slide, which is next. How do we tease that out? Uh, what, what does it mean? It, and again, if somebody uses a CBD-based tincture 10 times a day, never gets high from that, and they're dealing with you know, chronic back pain and whatever it may be, it, it, that could be seen as chronic use, right? But there's not really, there's not an intoxication from that. Somebody could be used once a month, but the one time they use, they take 50 milligrams of an edible and have an overwhelming experience. Although they would be seen as an, a, you know, a very non-chronic user, the impact was high. This is something, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for that, it, it, that any of us really do chronic versus moderate use. How do we get into that? Um, and so, okay, so I see the follow-up referring to smoking flour mostly. Okay, so even again, now I, I don't you think I'm avoiding here, but there's even with that, it's different. If, if someone's taking one hit in the, in the evenings, like some people may have a glass of wine, that might feel kind of different than like I'm getting, I'm smoking as much as possible whenever I can. I think we can equate that though to like drinking to get drunk is different than having a glass of wine with dinner. So if we think about are you, a harm reduction message could be what is how are you using this what's the motivation and how are you using it in a way to get as in, as high and intoxicated as possible or what's the what's the purpose of it why do you do this i think that's one way to approach it um, but again it, it gets really tricky do we say to someone well once a week or twice a week but only taking two hits right that i i don't know i don't know that we quite have that dialed in yet Great question though. Um, so I'm kind of leaving that one hanging a little bit. I'd love to hear from others what their perspective is on it. Okay, I'm gonna leave this beautiful picture. One last glance, there we go. So the questions for research and then we can just have the last bit of time for q and I, I really think that is one of them. Moderate versus chronic use. What would a, a harm, reduction, harm reduction message, if at all, look like? What does that look like? Does it, how does it resonate? How does it show up in Missouri versus California, does it look different based on law? Uh, how do we get into that? Even, you know, we know that students want to be able to talk about things in a realistic, honest way, but where do we find this balance between moderate and chronic use without getting into you know, nanograms per milliliter of blood and getting super technical, but thinking about it from their perspective on a user perspective? I think that's a great area of research to approach. I think this one too, medical application of specific cannabinoids, are there benefits? What's the risk? Are they useful in isolation? That's the thing I think we have to really understand. Some cannabinoids in isolation, 
without other cannabinoids involved may not be beneficial? What if they have to have other cannabinoids as a sort of assimilation to the body? They work in a synergistic way. We, we, we were, there's a big gap in understanding that in looking at it in a straightforward way. I think we had a great start in 2017 when the National Academy of Sciences document came out, this 400 page summary, looking at as much cannabis research as we have to this day, what's kind of real, where's a potential area of, of, of benefit, where's a potential areas of risk, what's mythology. I think that document was really interesting to look like at sleep. They found like, and they looked at kind of all these different data points at sleep and it's found cannabis in general, even like, THC based cannabis can help people, I guess, get to sleep, but then they, it suppresses REM sleep, right? So they get dream suppression. They get this uh, dream pressure builds up throughout the night and they often wake up at three or four in the morning and don't quite get a fully rested deep sleep. So it's found maybe CBD based products that could potentially be different where maybe help someone get to sleep but then it can, the sleep can be more longer term. Then it gets into this question of, well, are you now dependent on something to get to sleep? And what does that mean? You, so it, it, again, lots of areas of understanding specific cannabinoids. This one's really interesting to me. Do students in, re, do, do students in recovery, sorry, this was say students, not students. Do students in recovery in legal versus non-legal states view cannabis differently in terms of use? So as people start to approach, I think, recovery in... I don't, I don't want to say less dogmatic ways, but in ways that are individualized to them. I, I hear a lot about this in different ways to approach in different what works for certain people in certain contexts. How does then that show up for them? Where, what is their lens on that? Is use of cannabis something that they think, you know, a lot of times if you're, if, if you're in the world of recovery, a lot of people use tobacco. And even though we have some data that shows that can, tobacco can actually kind of precipitate a relapse, it seems to be a sort of acceptable thing in a way. Uh, not overly condoned, but I would say acceptable. So is that showing up with cannabis? What do we know about that? How does, what is the attitudes and perception of students in recovery, particularly based on the state they're in? I think that would be a really interesting study to get into more of. Um, and then uh, another one, I think I have this one and one more, a holistic examination of prohibition. Have we created what's called a gray market where something is grown legally in one state, it's kind of shipped off. So it's sort of legal, but then on the back end, it's not. So it goes into an underground economic system. And has that, have we created these dynamics where a lot of the kind of markers of prohibitions are still there as far as a little bit of maybe, especially depending who's dealing it, maybe some violence, a lot of money to be made, um, anxiety, fear, uh, arrest, all this kind of stuff, use of law enforcement resources on this. What actually is right? And when we think about, I think on the, on the university campuses, I think we have the best opportunity to really explore this, again, from all those different perspectives, a sociological perspective, criminal, psychological, user, wellness, health. What makes sense? What's the, the in 10 years, we're going to have a great body of data around what sort of shows up in legal states, especially the initial spikes in use and how they kind of level off and attitudes. But what if it were le illegal everywhere or legal everywhere? What sort of happens with that? We have to, I think, really approach that with a level of sophistication. And, and also thinking about even currently to this day with all the legalization that goes on, um, there's still a lot of illegal grows in the state of California. And they, there's a major environmental damage and destruction to the national forest where these are set up. A lot of the game wardens and people who have to work in law enforcement, it's a very threatening environment. They get shot at sometimes. We, it's dangerous. So we, we, again, thinking of all those factors, what makes the most sense for us to move forward as a society? And then the health impacts of concentrates. I think this is going to be a, a big area of research. We're trying to understand this, not just around contaminated concentrates, and we're seeing, obviously, this is coming up, but what about the psychological reactions for, you know, concentrates that are 90% THC? What is the, what, and what are potential different health implications for the lungs that maybe don't show up with smoking flour? So I think those are some of the major areas that I think we're, we're going to need to, to move forward with in, in a rational, honest um, way. Okay, so that's kind of a um, good st uh, stopping point. I have one last slide with just my contact information, but we do have some time for some questions or comments from people. If, if you just have a thought or perspective to share, that's, that's fine too. 
and hopefully you learned something in this, in this webinar today as well. I, that's my goal. I sometimes hope it meets a lot of different audiences. So Matt, I encourage you to put up your last slide while people are um, formulating any comments or questions they want to share. Great. Sounds good. And if you contact me, you go to my website. I'm not, I, I hate the self-promotional part of things, but for about the last 10 years, I do go to campuses, other colleges, high schools, um, community groups. I do a lot of presenting to students and different, whether it's student athletes or Greek affiliated students or just the general student body staff trainings. I love talking about this. So if you're ever interested in that kind of thing, bring someone to campus. I have plenty of resources, plenty of places I've been. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. I don't want to get overly self-promotional, but feel you know, feel free to reach out to me. If you want that handout that I showed at the beginning on the conversation piece, feel free to email me. I'll send you the PDF tonight. So the floor is open for comments or questions. Hey, Tanya. Oh, yep. okay. You stopped my share. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, what do you think? Is that people are hanging in there waiting, but no comments, no questions. There was a lot of good questions throughout, which was awesome. Anybody, anybody? Oh, I see one. Have there been conversations on the intersections of the use of cannabis and mental health challenges individuals face? I, I think this is a big one. I mean, I know um, with most of the mental health workers on the, the campuses I've gone to in my own campus, we, we talk about this quite a bit. Definitely. What are the what are the intersections? How are people using it? And again, I know there's there was some at University of Washington. They were really trying to understand this and look at okay, what if a what if a student actually self reports that a, a their cannabis is helping with their anxiety, but then help if they actually get off of it and they can get through the kind of week long withdrawals of poor sleep and agitation, all that stuff that they actually are kind of finding once it's cleared out of their system that they feel actually maybe less anxiety, but they're still, they're sort of using this as a way to, to manage and deal with anxiety. So I think we're going to have to understand that more as we continue to see anxiety um, rising, then people are using it to, as a form to deal with anxiety. But again, certain strains and products may actually be exacerbating anxiety. So I think, again, more area of research on that, but it's a big topic that I, I am talking about with a lot of people. You see the other question there? Um, oh, sorry, it's a comment. Oh yeah, just comment. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed the webinar. <laughs> Other comments or questions? We've got we've got time. And it looks like Tony, do you have you have a closing slide? I do, right here. Okay. And uh, yeah, okay. So in the absence, so first of all, we as you can see on this slide here, um, there are resources that we encourage you to check out uh, if you need them or anyone you know might need them. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see where, again, you can get the recording. And then lastly, we have additional webinars and podcasts. So the very next one coming up is January 27th. And that one will specifically look at how do you integrate collegiate recovery services with other campus services? So for example, you know, services specifically for college students in recovery um, that might include, say, recovery meetings, but also what about housing for students in recovery? Um, and then we have uh, another uh, event that will be specifically about interventions for uh, college students in recovery. And after both of those, um, we'll have podcasts to complement the webinars. And the podcasts really are just sort of a, what does this look like in terms of lived experience where students in recovery have conversations uh, with each other and with practitioners uh, about their experiences on those topics. So um, if no one has any other final comments or questions, let me take the opportunity to thank our speaker for his excellent yeah. presentation.
um, and thank all of you for attending. And we look forward to having you be involved in additional events. And again, please look forward to our um, evaluation email and we invite you to give your feedback to guide us for future events. Thank you so much for being a part of the Voice in Collegiate Recovery Project. I'm Tanya Nieri at the University of California, Riverside. Have a good day. Thanks everyone.